Hello there, you're watching the Pulse on the Joy News Channel. Ready for combat, echo as military chiefs signal their readiness to proceed with military intervention in Niger. As the bloc says, it remains resolute to ensure democratic order is restored no matter what. You see now is they You and your dedicated and loyal troops today stand on the threshold of history as professionals who are being tasked to help the people of West Africa to enable them continue to elect their leaders through free, fair, and transparent general elections. We've got uh, the latest for you as we hear exclusively from the ECOWAS Commission boss who's coordinating the deployment to Niger. Meanwhile, uh, though, Germany, uh, which uh, heads the Sahel Alliance, is pushing for a diplomatic resolution of the situation in Niger. These are the views uh, that we are getting from Germany and also the security experts who are sharing their concerns on the matter. We'll bring you up to speed shortly. Also coming up in this uh, package and battled former sanitation minister Cecilia Bernadapa has appeared in court today fighting off claims that the property found uh, in her house and uh, in her bank accounts are tainted properties. We'll tell you why Cecilia Bernadapa believes that um, there's more to the story that's been making rounds ever since the scandal broke. Also coming up this afternoon, EC Chairperson is accusing Parliament of undermining the efforts of the election management body and organising a credible election due to its failure to pass a new constitutional instrument. As a commission, we find it unfortunate that our efforts to strengthen the credibility and integrity of our voters' register and by extension our elections by the introduction of the draft CEI did not receive the support of Parliament. As more for your details, as the Electoral Commission reluctantly proceeds to register new voters and organize district level elections uh, with the existing constitutional instrument. Awesome. There's with no option than to rely on the current CI with its inherent challenges to conduct a voters registration exercise until such time as the NIA would become fully operational. Always a pleasure to be with you here on The Pulse. It's brought to you by Global Communities Digni Lu, Affordable Safe Sanitation for All and uh, partners uh, with uh, the Chalitwate Street Arts Festival, which is coming off on the 21st to the 27th of August uh, 2023. Follow us on Facebook, YouTube and the MyJoyOnline.com. We have more coming up your way shortly. I'm blessed as well. Please stay. And thanks for joining us. Chiefs uh, of uh, military and defense uh, amongst ECOWAS uh, member states say they are ready for a military action in Niger with the aim of restoring a democratic order uh, in the Republic of Niger. Uh, Ghana's defense minister, Dominic Nitiul, spoke at a meeting of chiefs uh, here in Accra this morning and indicated that Ghana is ready to commit troops to ECOWAS should all efforts uh, to negotiate with the military junta fails. The security chiefs uh, from 11 countries are currently meeting at Burma Camp in Accra to draw up a deployment plan following last month's coup in Niger, which toppled the government of President Mohamed Bazoum. Uh, we have an exclusive interview with the ECOWAS Commissioner uh, for Political Affairs and Peace as well as Security, Ambassador Abdel Fatal uh, Musa, for you shortly. First, though, uh, Ghana's Minister of Defense, Dominic Nitu, was speaking a while ago. If presidential guards in Guinea and Niger, I will use the word take hostage their president, nobody, and let me repeat, nobody in West Africa is safe. That is why I urge you to continue to be loyal to your heads of states. I urge you to continue to be loyal to ECOWAS directives and to give effect that the days that 
who the task enjoy the support of our people are over. Yes, in democracy, people will agree to disagree. But the vast majority of our people are you. The vast majority of our people in West Africa do not want to be under the difficulties that we are facing today. You have the right, as men in uniform, to ask your governments for what you will need to be able to defend your nations. You have the right to ask your governments to give you the tools to defend the territorial integrities of your nations, to ensure that your nations remain peaceful. You have the right to ensure that your people choose your leaders in a free and fair manner. But the world will disagree. ECOWAS will disagree. The people of ECOWAS will disagree when you choose or people under you choose to take hostage the people that your constitution give power to. Uh, the Defence Minister indicating the position of the Republic of Ghana a while ago at uh, Burma camp. But um, what's the next move for ECOWAS, knowing that it is going to activate the standby force? I've been speaking to ECOWAS Commissioner for uh, Political Affairs, Peace and Security, Ambassador Abdel Fatal Musa. The first uh, phase of the engagement uh, have, have actually uh, wrapped up here uh, at Burma camp and uh, we know that of course the essence of the meeting today is to have all of the military chiefs, all of the chiefs of defense from West African countries uh, converge here to discuss the decision uh, which is borders on the deployment of a military uh, troop into the Republic of Niger. The, the whole idea is to ensure that there is the reinstatement of President Mohamed Basum and also constitutional order is restored um, to the Republic of Niger. And the background to it is that uh, the Republic of Niger experienced a coup d'etat at the end, just at the tail end of last month, uh, a reason for which uh, we have uh, all of these meetings happening. Now, the last meeting or summit of the ECOWAS leaders uh, actually happened in Abuja. Now, after that meeting, the heads of states actually decided uh, to operationalize, or if, if we could use that word, activate an ECOWAS standby force. That, that was the basic decision of the leaders of the West Africa sub region. Subsequent to that, uh, we know that ECOWAS formed a committee of chiefs of defense staff who will now look at the operational methods that will be used by this Aboriginal body in terms of the deployment methods, what should be done and how that can be approached from a technical point of view. It's the reason for which we are at Burma Camp today. Uh, you, we saw the likes of the Defence Minister, Dominic Nitiu. Uh, we had uh, the Chief of Defence Staff for the Committee of West African States, uh, the uh, Chief of Defence Staff for the Republic of Nigeria, joining uh, the meeting which, which, which is underway here at uh, Burma Camp, General Body ECOWAS. There's also the bigger question about the UN Security Council decision as to whether or not the sub region has any form of backing from, from the UN um, Security Council. That question came up, and the simple response from the sub-regional body ECOWAS is that, look, we don't need the uh, you know, decision or tax approval or express permission from the United Nations Security Council. All we need is to ensure, first of all, uh, that we deploy, and I'm speaking from the position of the Economic Community of West African States, when the deployment is done, whatever briefing that needs to be given to the UN about the situation and why the West African leaders are going in will be furnished to the United Nations. However, being a group of sovereign countries, there's absolutely no need for any form of deployment. So we'll be getting to Ambassador Fatel shortly just to get some um, briefing on what the next steps are, what the way is, and how we can actually deal uh, with the situation now. And
and what the meeting entails for today because that's crucial. After today, we know that the uh, chiefs of defense staff will round off their meeting tomorrow and will communicate to the world what the next line of action will be. There's a question about the Republic of Ghana as well and what the Republic of Ghana will do in terms of our position. Are we committing our troops? Are we contributing troops? Are we going to deploy uh, our forces to be part of this uh, sub-regional body? Knowing that countries such as Cape Verde, Cape Verde for instance, opted out and did not attend the meeting for today. So is the reason for which uh, all of these discussions are going right here, going on right here at the uh, Burma Hall uh, at the military headquarters where, we, of course, we're, we're coming to you live from. Uh, let's uh, try and engage Ambassador um, Musa Fatal. Uh, we'll be engaging him shortly. He'll just uh, walk into the shot, obviously, because of uh, the situation we have uh, in, in the day. We know uh, that, obviously, there's a need for us to get a, a brief word from him. So, Ambassador uh, Musa will, will join us shortly uh, for us to get a, a brief word from him. Uh, Ambassador, thank you for yeah. joining us on the journey, Shannon. You could just uh, come closer so yeah. we, we have a word. We know that uh, the security chiefs, you're having your meeting today. Yeah. Uh, first of all, your impression about the engagements that, that, that have transpired in the first hour of the meeting? Oh, the, 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 this meeting. Yes. I mean, you could see determination. You could see unity of purpose among our uh, military chiefs. Yeah, the chiefs of defense staff, all very determined, you know, and they are just putting the final touches to their operational plans and then get our troops ready. This is more or less a bit like a, a pledging, uh, what is the meeting, because the concept of operation is already ready, it's ready. Uh, all the factors have been taken into account, what are the potential obstacles, how to overcome them, all these were taken into account in the planning session. Right. right. So this meeting is just to, you know, refine uh, what we have while preparing for possible intervention. And uh, my interaction with the chiefs of defense staff, of course, of all the members that are here, you know, was that they are all determined. You determined know, to go, determined and the question is when? The, not when I'm not going to tell you because that's a that's no I'm not because that's an operational secret. When you tell them we are going to start marching tomorrow, then you give them uh, advance notice, you know, to defend. You know, so we know when the military could go in, uh -huh. and up till now, there are diplomatic overtures from ECOWAS, from other uh, what is it? Um, uh, willing partners and others. We are giving diplomacy maximum opportunity, you know, to succeed. What we are saying is that if that fails, there is this other option. You know, and this is what we are doing, and we are not letting off, uh, despite the fake news and then the misinformation. And I believe the fake news you're talking about is the fact that you do not have African Union support and the support from uh, the United Nations, correct? That is all, uh, with African Union, that is also fake news. Has anybody read the communique of the African Union Peace and Security Council? I was there, participated. You know, in it, what you are hearing, yeah, of course, when you have a situation like this, you are going to have different opinions. What matters is what comes out of the communique. So everybody should wait for the communique. And then you realize that uh, the African Union Peace and Security Council supports all the measures being taken by uh, ECOWAS to restore constitutional order. They've condemned it, and many of them are even calling for the suspension of Niger. Ambassador Fatou, are you mindful of the possible implication for the Saab region? Mali, Burkina Faso have said that they would, you know, support the Nigerian junta if you decide to go in. Are you mindful that of a possibility of a full-blown war? We are very mindful of that. And in the planning phase, all these factors were taken into account. I can tell you confidently, you know, that uh, these uh, ECOWAS standby for troops are ready to take on all comers. This is what I will tell you. And that uh, the threats or whatever by Burkina Faso, Mali, have all been taken on board. Yeah. And, uh, Why not dialogue? Dialogue? Yeah. The dialogue. Uh, who is closing the door? Probably, I, well, it, it could it be is, ECOWAS. No, no, it is them. Uh, listen, just a few days back, 
we were planning ECOWAS AU UN mission to go and meet them. They shut the door on us, saying they are not ready to receive the mission. You're setting about that report? Which one? That, that they shut their doors, because the word you used in your communique was that you were repelled, Those, the mission was repelled. Exactly. Is that the true account of what you that, That's the true account. We were going, mm-hmm. and they said they were not ready to receive were, were you us. Were part of this mission? I was. I was part of it. Secondly, before even then, uh, the chair of the Equus Authority, President uh, Ahmed Bola Tinubu of Nigeria, also, despite the former head of state, General Abdul Salam Abu Bakar, with the Sultan of Sokoto, to go also and talk to them. They confined them to the airport. They confined them to the airport. They didn't allow them citing so-called explosive security situation in town, which is all false. All right. So, so we have been extending the hand of dialogue. You know, to them, they are rejecting it. Okay. Recently, they've said they are ready to talk. They say they are ready to talk, and then the next day, they charge President Bazoum, who has been under their uh, what is it? Uh, uh, yeah, confinement as a hostage, charging him with a high treason. You know, and yeah, somebody that uh, you, you've arrested, kept, uh, you know, in detention for how many weeks, is now that you are finding high treason against him. You know, so these guys are making up, you know, uh, justifications for their coup as they go along. And they will soon run out of excuses. You know, so that is it. So we have not shut the door to dialogue. Well, ECOWAS is ready to dialogue, yeah, but also right. we are not going to have an elastic Okay, dialogue. I'll ask you shortly about the criticisms that you're being used, quote-unquote, by some other external forces. But the, the fear is that you're radicalizing this military uh, team, mm-hmm. the fact that the life of President Mohamed uh, Bazoum and his family is at risk. The, the more you radicalize them, yeah. anything else could happen. Well, uh, we have said yeah. we are going to hold the janta responsible if anything anything untoward happens to uh, to undermine the physical integrity the security the safety of Mohamed Bazoum and his family they will pay dearly and dearly here means uh, the, uh, well uh, i'm not going to spell out you how they are, uh, yes I'm, I'm not going to spell out what what will happen to them but what i'm telling you is that there is a lot of fake news you know around right uh, this is like equas is being used did the uh, france uh, or the us or anybody uh, script our protocols for us well, well the reason why some have that perception is because just yesterday we were um interacting with our partners at DW. The indication is that, for instance, the German uh, Minister for Development and Cooperation will be in Abuja. Uh, She is chairing the Sahel Committee, which obviously has some French elements in there. Concerns about how we are making the Saab region now a playground for a proxy war between, you know, the the superpowers. Do we have the capacity Uh, to go in fully? We have the capacity to go in. That's number one. Number two, what baffles me is that those who are talking about uh, what is it? Equa uh, uh, being teleguided by the West are those who are also promoting Russia. Okay, in the same, the same people are those who see Russians as saviors. So when will Africa find saviors among themselves instead of always looking for external partners, either the uh, China, uh, America? Uh, Russia and other. When are we going to uh, project our own agency? That's the problem. You know, since the 1960s, right, Africa has always been an arena for proxy wars. First between the Soviet Union, uh, China on one side, and then the West. And today, we are in a multipolar environment, and we are running around from the frying pipe pan to the fire. Uh, leave the Americans, leave the French, uh, now the Russians are the saviors. The, the, the Chinese are the saviors. The Turks are the saviors. We have got all these forces in the region. Uh, all those who have Africa at heart, right, should try to generate internal 
resistant to all these and not to oppose one and then be welcoming the other on the other are not receiving funds from the west from the french or we are not receiving nothing zero we are not receiving anything the heads of state have said we are going into uh, niger if need be with our own resources finally uh, the un security council um <laughs> you know uh, backing it's very necessary for you knowing that you know the world is also watching what's happening do you do you feel that that you've you flouted that protocol the need to you know okay. ensure that yeah. you work together with the united nations when was the when did the security council last have unanimity maybe because of the among, geopolitics among so you may not have it, because of geopolitics so it is obvious that uh, even if you are going to talk about climate change there will be a p5 member who will veto it much less this situation multilateralism is dead we are in a world of multipolarity the security council will never be unanimous and you just need the veto of one of the five powers okay permanent members and then it is dead why waste your time we have received the support of the United Nations Secretariat. The Secretary General has severally backed what Ecowas is doing. He has called for the release of Bazoum. He has condemned his detention and all that. For us, that is more than enough. Okay. So finally, what message do you have for the people of Ghana, some who are anxious that the, the, the region may be destabilized? Yeah. Uh, look, fellow Ghanaians, I am a Ghanaian myself, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, so yeah, so this is it. You see, uh, we are talking about uh, if we don't go in, if they refuse dialogue, what I would say to fellow Ghanaians is that the situation there will be worse than it is currently. There are already internal fishes that we are picking up. Okay, a, a country like Niger that re, uh, sort of managed their diversity very well in the past, particularly the Tuaregs question. Today, they are saying that we, the Tuaregs and the Arab, yeah, the majority who are the Hausa, the Kanuri, the Jerma, are now uh, denying us the ability also to contribute to nation building through leadership. And already there are past uh, guerrilla leaders okay uh, who are mobilizing against this janta you know so not uh, not everything is uh, okay even within the country forget about what we hear there isn't that unity and the thing is that those who are fearing uh, that the consequences of a possible military intervention should exert pressure on the janta to go for the peaceful option uh, Equus has not closed that door. This is what I repeat all the time. We haven't closed the door, but people c concentrate all their comments on the military option. They are not talking about all the other options that are on the table. Okay, so this is this is what I We're tell grateful. You. Definitely, the meeting will wrap up tomorrow. Grateful for your okay. time. Thank you uh, for joining us. And that's uh, Ambassador uh, Fatal Musa, who's the uh, Commissioner for the uh, ECOWAS. Uh, the, that's uh, the, the Secretariat the, in charge of um, you know political affairs uh, at ECOWAS. And it's uh, our way of wrapping up here uh, from the military headquarters, Burma Camp, where that meeting is still underway. We're hoping that by the end of tomorrow there'll be consensus, and we'll hear collectively uh, from the Committee of Chiefs of Defence that would wrap up and communicate to West Africa uh, the modus operandi of that ECOWAS standby force that will be uh, restoring constitutional order in Asia. Blessed Sugan reporting for Joy News, Bermakam, Accra. Okay, uh, right after that, here I am in the studio and uh, doing more analysis on uh, the meeting which transpired today. So far, there's been uh, opposition to the planned military action uh, with the Christian Council, for instance, in Ghana and other civil society groups pushing for diplomatic efforts. But the big question is, and which we're seeking some answers today to, is that should ECOWAS proceed to intervene uh, when it comes to the political situation in Niger? Well, we've been asking some of our viewers uh, on social media. So let's get to uh, social media and get uh, some of the um, feelings and sentiments that we have uh, on there. And we've been doing that, for instance, on X, right? No more tweet, Twitter. So it's, uh, it's X now. Right, so we're asking the question, should Ghana contribute um, troops to the ECOWAS standby force to Niger? That's the question we're asking. So, uh, for instance, you have um, an option if you feel you are indifferent. So that's where we stand, for instance. Um, we, we are standing 
you know, in the middle. For instance, we're giving that option that we're indifferent about it. But if you take a look at uh, the views that we have so far, and we started this just uh, some few uh, hours ago, uh, minutes, in fact, upon coming uh, on air, you would realize that there's uh, this whole wave of uh, resentment against the decision to deploy the troops into Niger. Uh, that's because, just take a look at it, 11.2% say, well, you can go ahead and intervene when it comes to the situation in Niger. And a significant population of, of about 82.5% are saying, no, we don't agree with that option. Uh, quite a few also uh, are in the middle, just like we are being indifferent about the situation, uh, amounting to some 6.3% of the population, which believes that, um, well, whatever the decision may be, whatever uh, the outcome may be, uh, the feeling is that you could go, you, you could also stay where you are. But it's quite clear, a stark difference in terms of those who disagree and those who agree. And the difference is very, very significant. 80% plus indicating that they would want our uh, ECOWAS leaders, leaders from the West Africa South region, to desist from going ahead with that uh, intervention. Uh, it's the reason for which we're having this discussion, because uh, ECOWAS says that it will fund the military action from their own resources, resources which actually means that uh, in the coming days, this will be done through the efforts of myself, yourself, the general public, because Ghana would also essentially uh, be contributing some troops to, to be a part of the ECOWAS uh, for. So we actually uh, hit the streets of Accra to find out what you've also been saying about this decision. We know that we are in deep crisis now, but the key point too is our brothers that need our aid. Uh -huh. So this the, even though we are in crisis, a major crisis, uh -huh. it's our Ghanaian money though, but it's, it's, it's a humanitarian support that we are giving to them. Ask yourself, what is the main reason? What is going on there? You should know, you and I, we should know what is going on there because of bad governance. That is why those kind of things is going on there. Likewise, let's come back to Ghana. Look at what is going on. People stealing money, hiding those money in their homes. Bank of Ghana losing a whole lot of money. So whatever is happening in Niger, I do concord it. I do support it. But for government should waste money in deploying our military men to go there. I, I, I don't concord it. So they need something like that. They need our help to go and I mean, support them for them to stop fighting. Fighting is not good at all. Uh -huh. Niger need the word of God. Uh -huh. They lack so many things that we also have to support them to stop what they are doing. Okay, um, so some Ghanaians there sharing their thoughts about uh, the uh, meeting which is underway and whether or not the countries uh, in ECOWAS should be deploying their troops. It's also got to do with capacity. So what's the capacity of the uh, military force uh, among some of the West African countries? My colleague uh, Isaac Ophiage is a data analyst with the research desk here at Joy News. Uh, he's been uh, looking at the military options, the strengths of these uh, countries, over 11 of them, as we understand, going into this joint operation. Let's start off with the military force. Uh, that, that we have. And after we do this, uh, we'll try and hear from some of our guests helping us with the discussion. Colonel uh, Festus Abaji is also on, and uh, we have Mukta Mumuni Mukta who will be joining us shortly. But, but I want us to understand the figures uh, involved here. What's the strength, and when we're talking about the strength of the forces, how is it looking like for countries such as Ghana and other uh, you know, West African uh, countries? So if you look at, on the whole, the West African sub-region and if you look at the military force, we are looking at somewhere around 500,000 active troops, and we understand that Nigeria is more or less like the powerhouse of this um, you know, active military uh, personnel, um, having around more than two, uh, 200,000 active troops. If you look at Ghana, for instance, we are looking at somewhere around 16,000. Mm -hmm. Togo is having around 10,000, with other countries having around, you know, a um, around 20,000, 20, 16,000. And, and in fact, the indication we're getting from the experts is that you need more than a, a 30,000 exactly. force to, to go and, in there. And, and uh, let's, let's do this. Let, let's hear from Kenel first, uh, Isaac, we'll get into the uh, data for you shortly. Uh, and Kenel, you've been monitoring the meeting um, that, that transpired earlier today. The indication we're getting, and you just heard from Ambassador Fatal uh, there, indicating that they will go in, certainly. As for the time, they will not disclose that. So the debate is over as to whether or not ECOWAS we're going. Well, 
Pastor, thanks for having me once again. What the Ambassador Musa Fatal said makes sense that they cannot disclose what I will call the D-Day, the day on which ECOWAS will initiate hostility. But the signals from ECOWAS clearly is that ECOWAS is being more jingoistic. You see, more than emphasizing diplomacy. And when you ask him about diplomacy or you ask ECOWAS about diplomacy or the diplomatic option, it refers to uh, delegations that went there a week or two ago and were rebuffed. Is ECOWAS playing a timeline on diplomacy that in such instances and in you know, cognizance of ECOWAS's own experiences. When you engage with somebody you are in dispute with, after 14 days, if you hadn't had a response, that is where you draw the line and say that, okay, the diplomatic option is out of the question. Because we all know that after uh, General Abdul Salam, former head of state, had been rebuffed, a delegation of clergy went there and they were received. We also know that a few days ago, the prime minister, newly appointed prime minister, went to Chad. And the Chadian leader had been the first to go to Niamey. Now, that is a track one diplomacy. The diplomacy that we're talking about is not only between ECOWAS and Niger. It is also about other key actors especially our neighboring countries like Chad and so on and so forth, and other civil society entities, former head of states and so on. That's track two. That is part of the diplomacy. So I have a bit of difficulty for anybody who suggests that after two weeks of engagement, if there hasn't been the desired uh, outcome from ECOWAS's perspective, that is the end of the diplomatic option. Now, what ECOWAS is doing is that ECOWAS has taken a position that we are coming to invade. Now, in conflict resolution, it doesn't work that way. So ECOWAS takes a position and trenches itself. Niger takes a position and trenches itself. And then you have a stalemate. So we are in a stalemate because sincerely, ECOWAS is not negotiating genuinely. And it's trying to place timelines and so on and so forth. And I think ECOWAS needs to tone down on what I called earlier the saber rattling, and try and emphasize more of the diplomacy, you see. But it's understandable in Ambassador Musa Fatal's own words. That is part of the strategy of the strategic ambiguity, as he calls it. But leaning too much towards that extreme end of the use of force might not help in the long run. Of course, we should all know, and Equus knows, the military chiefs know that this is not a game of prophecy. It's not a game of prediction. It's a game of analysis. And this intervention could go either way. So you cannot even say that there is a 50-50 chance that ECOWAS is going to have the upper hand. So the statements like we have information that Niger is divided and so on, it's all propaganda. You see what I mean? Sincerely, if it has information, what are the sources? Now, the ambassador is saying that the AU Peace and Security Council has not issued a communique and that it is fake news that the PSC does not endorse the ECOWAS position. The question is, Please, why yeah. has the PSC, since the AU Peace and Security Council, mm -hmm. since it met last month, Today is Thursday. It's not the norm that after a meeting that takes place on Monday, by Thursday there hasn't been a communique. Because it's not fake news. We also have contacts at the AU and in Addis Ababa. And yeah, but, but his point is that, that, that he was in that very meeting. You heard him say that, that he was present at, at, yeah, at that meeting. But he's telling, one side, he's telling one side of the story. Mm. The other side of the story is that the PSC is a continental body. Granted that ECOWAS has more seas because we have many more member states, that is a 15, than other regions. But regionally or sub-regionally speaking, the three 
of the five sub-regions of Africa are not in favor of the intervention. The Maghreb, North Africa, is not in favor. Eastern Africa is not in favor. And in fact, Central Africa is not in favor. And SADC is not in favor. So ECOWAS diplomatically is isolated. This is an ECOWAS operation, yes. But ECOWAS is now embarking on a coalition course with the rest of Africa. And in due course, ECOWAS might have to pay the, the price. Argument, the so argument, where, yeah, and, and ECOWAS, Kenno, let, let me just bring that to your notice. The argument from uh, Ambassador Fatal uh, Abdel is that they, they do not need the express permission of any other um, you know, continental body or the United Nations Security Council to go in Tunisia. That, that's his argument. We're, we're a group of sovereign states um, you know, assessing the risk and the immediate threats in our own sub-region. There are two things that we're talking about here. We're talking about leg legality yeah. and legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Now, international uh, political support for any multilateral intervention or project is key. It's one of the success factors. So if you're going to go to Niger as ECOWAS, and you don't have the international public support, political support behind you, it's not, it's not sufficient. You refer to UN Security Council and say, oh, we don't need, uh, we don't need their express permission, we don't mm. need the express permission of the AU. Yeah. If that be the case, why did the COAS in that communique of 10th August requested, why did it request, sorry, yeah. the, the endorsement? What is the meaning of the English word endorsement? You see what I mean? Is it that they should take note of? They should have said so. And indeed, this, this diplomatic expression, take note of, and substantively endorse, was a bone of contention at the PSE uh, meeting where they wanted to take note of. And Akua said, no, it's not enough. We want you to be fair that you endorse. So you see, what he's telling us is part of the politics of Equus. But I'm saying that even if we are not in the PSC Council in Addis Ababa, there are sources who also disseminate information. Right. I may very well have obtained my information from a SADC, you know, a diplomat or yes. from anywhere. But the truth of the matter is that ECOWAS is diplomatically, politically okay. isolated. isolated. I, see. I get that point. And now. that isolation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, yeah, so, so, so moving on, we know, and they are emphatic now that they will move in. What are your fears about the possible implications for the Zab region? We need, to, we need to go back to the statement that he keeps making strategic ambiguity. Because if ECOWAS is to stop like this meeting, if the meeting had not come on, and ECOWAS had gone silent about any intervention, then that gives the upper hand to Niger. The point I'm making is that ECOWAS needs to find a fine balance between leaning too much on the jingoism angle and something on the other side of diplomacy. That is a balance ECOWAS needs to make. Now, as to whether it should go in or it can go in or not go in, after this planning, that is one of the stages, right? Mm -hmm. Any plan is on paper. Now countries need to go home, assuming Ghana has pledged whatever it is. Ghana needs to go home and find out where it is going to get the men and the women, the armored cars, assuming there are fighters, planes, and so on, or support helicopters and so on. Assuming our ships are going to play a role, for instance, yeah. our artillery, our engineers, mm -hmm. our communicate. Now we need to find these resources. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a chess board game. Right. That you're going to take something from the Boku conflict. You might take something maybe from Operation Calm Life. You might take it from anywhere. Some money, the operational budget, we know that we are broke. But you can cut from here and there. My sense is that there is nowhere to cut. Because this government has virtually collateralized almost every revenue stream. Now, if you have collateralized, then you don't have the option of taking a bit from GetFund, from ESLA, from wherever. We owe school feeding program, don't we? Yeah, we do. So what about, yes, we are in areas of the common fund and so on and so forth. 
So even me not being an economist, economist, I'm finding it difficult to find out or determine where the government is going to find the money. Mm. Let's remember that. Per the ECOWAS arrangement, which is part of the African standby force mechanism, each country going into this operation must be able to subsist on its own for 90 days. So if we are going, Ghana must fund its intervention for 90 days, or if you like, maybe 30 days, between 30 and 90 days. And then ECOWAS will reimburse. Now, they're now going to write other agreements that are not on the table. There has to be a contribution agreement between ECOWAS and each member state, stating the commitments on both sides. You see what I mean? Without those agreements, yes, there has been a communique, there has been a plan, but the member states will not okay. move their troops. Here, here's it's what... part of the bigger picture. Yes, mm. please. And here's what I, I want us to, to wrap up our conversation with, uh, that the point about Ghana and, and our mm -hmm. decision to contribute. The defense minister says that regardless of the disagreements among the rank and file of the military, they must remain, quote, loyal. I mean, those were his words. He's asking all, all the military chiefs to be loyal to ECOWAS and to the state. Are we, like, is it, are we getting a sense from that statement that, that there's some sort of division or maybe um, unpopularity, if I could use that word, amongst the rank and file of the military about this decision? Before I answer, may I ask you, did yeah. the minister really say that there are some divisions or reservations or whatever within the armed forces? So did his point is, that? you must remain loyal regardless. Just remain loyal to ECOWAS yes. uh, in, in spite of your opinion on, on the matter. Yes, but if you now stretch that statement to mean that there are divisions, I think that is not the way to think about it. Indeed, there are mechanisms within the armed forces to gauge the mood of the troops, the morale of the troops. As we speak, the high command knows what the mood of the soldiers are. So let's assume that a significant majority will not say we oppose it or we are in favor, but being soldiers, they will go along with the government decision. You see what I mean? Now, one reason why I think, and I said government must think twice, is that I have introduced the element of just cause. You cannot have a decision taken by ECOWAS, of which four of the decision makers are clearly non-democrats who have violated the same principles that ECOWAS is now standing on to go to Niger. So, you know, I beg to differ. Unless ECOWAS says that, yes, this is a watershed period, and after Niger, any country whose leader, civilian, military otherwise violates the ECOWAS uh, supplementary protocol on governance and democracy or democracy mm -hmm. and governance, we will go and intervene. Now I'm saying that is that a practicable strategic approach? Right. Because Niger is in all likelihood, it's not going to be the last. And I indeed, see. if we're going to go on that tangent, within the last 10 years or so, we would have mounted about 14 interventions in African member states, including the four whose leaders are now saying that they support the intervention. And I want to mention the names. It includes Watara. And it, it includes, Nya, Nya, what do you call it? Fari Fari Nassim Nassim yes. yes. And it includes Atanase Talon in, in, uh, in Benin. You see, so the, the whole idea is that there is a club mentality that when you touch civilian leaders, you have you know, you have committed a taboo. It's an abomination. But when these civilian leaders misbehave themselves, and they misgovern, and mismanage, and they corrupt, and I've been asking, why are we not talking about right. the fundamental reasons? There are corruption elements in there. There are civil military relations elements in there, right? There are security management issues right. there. So governance is not about four-year cycle elections. There are many, many nitty-gritty things. Mm. So we should not get away with that, okay, we'll have the chance to go and vote every four years, and then after that is business as usual. That is not the idea. That's not the concept of, right. uh, what do you call it, democracy. I see.
And now, first, Mr. Bajiri, we're well, grateful uh, that you're spending some time with us uh, this afternoon. The story is just unfolding. We'll definitely uh, get more updates. Isaac Kofi AJ is still with us here in the studio. Uh, Mukhtar Mumuni Mukhtar is also joining us uh, shortly uh, to comment on the data that we've been looking at. And Isaac, you just started about um, the numbers. Uh, and, and you were co you know, comparing some of the countries, for instance. We, we could look at Ghana, for instance, because that's our main concern here well, in the country. I, I think what's actually on the table right mm -hmm. now is the financial muscle to carry out this military operation or to stage this yeah. intervention. And ECOWAS themselves, they've been speaking to the UN Security Council. Mm -hmm. And since 2020, they've yeah. always wanted to set up this um, ECOWAS standby force mm -hmm. with thousands of troops, but they've been set, there's been setbacks uh, just because of funding and also, um, you know, um, um, insufficient troops con commitment. Yeah. So since 2020... Mm -hmm. They've had this, you know, um, issue that they had to battle with. But they, they finally settled on two options that they are looking at uh, in terms of how they are going to deploy uh, and, and what will be the budget involved. Okay. The so, first one yes, is that, the numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, they, they probably will set up a brigade of 5,000 troops. 5,000? 5,000. 5,000. Okay. An annual cost of $2.3 billion annually. ECOWAS is going to establish a brigade. And that will cost the, you know, the, the sub-region two points. Uh, and, for, and for those of you watching us, that, that, that's a, the, I mean, summary on the exactly, screen for you. Exactly. That's, that's so so five, a brigade of 5,000 mm -hmm. troops uh, at a cost of 2.3 billion U.S. dollars. Annually, yeah. We need our 2.3 plus for, for, for economic stabilization. Exactly. We, we ourselves <laughs> we need such monies. And the second option is yeah. that they will probably set up, you know, uh, on-demand mm -hmm. uh, troops uh, that will cost them around $360 million. Okay, so this could be the buffer. Exactly. Right. So we have a feeling or per the information we are gathering, it looks as if this is actually the budget that ECOWAS can actually afford. Because at, at this point, you can't go and say, I am setting up a brigade yeah. to train people. You need uh, the troops on demand. So that will cost you an estimated at least... 360, 360 million U.S. dollars. And, and, and let's do some, some quick math. Okay. So 360 million, that U means US every month you'll be mm -hmm. spending $30 million. Yeah. Every week you'll be spending $7.5 million. Mm -hmm. And every day that will cost you $1.1 million. Echo, as they say... There's no superpower involved in this. We are going to fund this by ourselves. So, and and the cost of a, a, a ticket to just fly over to Niger yeah. will cost way yeah. less. Yeah. Way so, less. So, I guess 0.1% of that budget. Absolutely. Margin, even less. Absolutely. And yeah. even feeding the troops mm -hmm. and probably other accoutrement accoutre accoutre that you have to buy, the, you know. That will be significant. That will be very significant. So at this point, ECOWAS will have to weigh the options. Mm -hmm. You know, you have two options on the table. One is... Do you still go on with your diplomatic, you know, engagement and probably set up that your 5,000 brigade and later on use it to, to serve as a deterrent mm. to, add, uh, you know, other yeah. people who would want to take over civilian government or you want to go and use your own... 2.3 billion uh, dollars. Yeah, yeah. But I, I also want us to look at domestically, mm -hmm. Ghana, do yes, we have that, our situation? Mm -hmm. Do we have that financial muscle to, mm -hmm. to actually participate in this? So we are looking at the... Uh, defense ministry's budget for 2023 is somewhere around 3.7 uh, billion Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. And that 3.7 billion Ghana cities, if we do some you know, quick conversion, that's around $380 million. That's so we'll just be spending that on the troops on demand. It does not even cater for, for the main... for the entire <laughs> defense ministry or for the country's defense. So if you take that away, it's gone. In fact, the point I'm trying to make is that $350 million... Yes. In terms of defense, it's, 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 it's a paltry it's, figure. Exactly. Nothing to it's, write. It's, it's something very small. And okay. if you look at the amount that we are spending on defense adv advisory for 2023, that's 10 million uh, Ghana cities, $1 million for defense advice. Oh, okay. I almost said we could, there's a place we could find that amount easily, right? We, we know where to find $1 million. Of course. Absolutely. Anyway. That's, that's just, by the way. Uh, Mukhtar Mumuni Mukhtar is joining us uh, via Zoom. Uh, Mukhtar, I mean, the figures are staggering. $2.3 billion just to fight for who? Uh, the reinstatement of President Bazoum. And, and that's by no means um, undermining ECOWAS, knowing that the, the region says it's being threatened by, by the growth in military coup d'etat. But 
the amount involved. Should, should, we, should we be worried about the cost? Well, um, I think our conversations around this issue has to go beyond just the uh, economic cost of it to us directly. It goes beyond just the economic cost to us. It has, you know, other implications in terms of livelihood, in terms of long-term and medium-term uh, security challenges for Nigeria and for the entire West African sub-region. Uh, if you notice, and I've just been listening to your analysts mention the, I mean, the various figures, uh, especially the defense budget of Ghana, uh, it's less than 25 percent of what is projected to be spent uh, on this uh, operation. And so that tells you the huge or significant economic cost it would be uh, to, to Ghana and to any other party that is involved in this operation. Uh, and I think that it's important that we look at the long-term consequences of it. Very often, uh, when you deploy uh, military operations or security operations of this nature, there are several other outcomes, unintended outcomes, that would impact significantly on the cost, the economic impact, and other livelihoods. And there's something we call a mission creep. We haven't had you know, anywhere in detail in terms of the operational objectives of this mission in Niger. They are talking about prevailing on the military leaders to reinstall President Bazoum to take charge of the country. But what does that mean? Is that all there is to this operation? We haven't seen significantly in specific terms. What are the objectives of it? So we know that when we accomplish that, we know that we have accomplished what we have we set out to do. Very often with that defined objective, there's a potential for what we call mission creep. The potential that you could stay far beyond what you originally intended to go in there to execute. And that would have huge consequences for the operation. I think that we need to be very, very uh, thorough in terms of the engagement, in terms of analysis for the implications of this operation. Other than that, uh, we may be uh, getting ahead of ourselves in authorizing a military mission in Niger. If you listen to what has happened since morning here in Burma Camp, in Ghana, it appears that ECOWAS, you know, I mean, I can appreciate that it's a very difficult situation for ECOWAS. And because and it's because we have missed several opportunities in the past to put things aright in dealing with security in the sub-region. And so now is the next best time to deal with it. But we have to be careful about the way we do it. Because I sense that in the communication of ECOWAS, it appears that they are very determined to uh, use the military option in Niger instead of exploring all the other options that were talked about in terms of engagement, diplomacy, and all that. And I can hear the justification built around the idea that the military leaders have not been willing to engage. But we have seen, you know, in the last couple of weeks, some engagements have happened. The military leaders have engaged, you know, leaders from Nigeria, from Chad, and other places. And our own, you know, research here has indicated that the military leadership is interacting with other actors within the region. And so all these things show the possibility that the military leaders could be engaged outside of the military intervention that we seem to be obsessed with, you know, I mean, uh, by way of ECOWAS. Okay. Um, are, you, are you by that suggesting that, that we cannot fund this, we cannot sustain this? Well, I'm not in a position to talk about the economic capacity of Ghana, but what we know publicly uh, is that we do not seem to be in the right position uh, to deal with this situation economically. We already have a very, very difficult economic situation. Uh, households are struggling, you know, businesses are struggling, young people in terms of unemployment, we are struggling to deal with this issue. And so uh, if you bring in an element, you know, of an operation that would commit us to some significant economic, you know, uh, you know commitment, it would be huge on us. And I don't think that we will sustain it. And if you listen to the economists, they tell you that this is the worst we have been probably in a very long time, in about maybe half a century. We haven't been in this situation in terms of the difficulty that we are in. And so, if anything, we should be leading in terms of mobilizing regional support for deploying you know, diplomatic options to show you know, Ghana's diplomatic powers, non-military you know, tools for negotiation and resolving this issue peacefully. If you notice, Ghana has been chosen for this meeting of military, you know, chiefs within the region, and is, you know, owing to the long-term stability and peaceful that Ghana enjoys. And so we should take the lead as a regional leader for peace and security, and ensure that we do not, you know, get judged by generations later 
or any negative role in regional security. So I think that we have to be very cautious about the way we do this and buy enough time to look at all the other options uh, in engaging in, in this situation. Uh, I mean, the decision of Ghana to host this, what are the direct or remote impact in terms of possibility um, on, on our country? Uh, because the feeling of some experts is by what we're doing, we're sending that signal that we're the forerunners when it comes to the military action. We have our citizens, nationals there in Niger. That's a, a security threat, isn't it? Yes, on one hand, uh, it gives us some prominence in terms of regional leadership in dealing with security in the region. And for that, I support that, that kind of initiative to take a leading role in dealing with security situation or problems within the South region. But we also have to look at the uh, implications it would have on us in long term, short term. Already, you are hearing people from Niger, Ghanaian based in Niger, talking about the fact that there's some kind of communication going on, going around within Niger, that if, they, if everyone specializes military action, citizens are going to rise up against you know, uh, nationals from these countries that are part of the ECOWAS decision. And that directly puts our citizens in danger in Niger. And so that is a possibility, and that is a, you know, a very, very real danger uh, to consider. Uh, the other part is, uh, no matter how it goes, whether we go ahead with the military action or we go with the diplomatic tools in terms of options, uh, it has you know, both positive and negative consequences for us. So I think that in principle, I agree. I support the idea that Ghana should host this kind of engagement. But at the same time, we need to look at all the broader implications it has for all of us. And to, to be safe in terms of how we could play a very positive role in it, we need to be very exhausted in terms of the diplomatic and non-military ways to deal with it. And I think that this engagement today, we should build on it in a much more positive way. I'm not comfortable with the way ECOWAS is speaking about it because it appears that they are staging a very belligerent, bellicose posture when it comes to the military option because the conversation seems to be more disproportionately focused on the military option. And you hear the spokesperson, you know, you hear Ambassador uh, Musa talk about this, and he appears to be justifying the decision even before we arrive at that decision, saying that we do not need unanimous or unanimity in terms of going into Niger, military intervention. He talks about the fact that, in fact, he has declared that multilateralism is there. And so it doesn't matter how many people support this decision, it has to be done. And that is dangerous, because we are running and getting ahead of ourselves in that decision. We need, because the understanding in the beginning was that this engagement is a deliberation regarding what are the options, what are the implications, how do we go about it? Should we go in, should we not? But at the point, I mean, at this point, if you are justifying military intervention, it appears that that decision has been made in the bedroom before, right. you know, coming out publicly well, okay. to talk about it. Yeah, uh, we'll leave it here for now. Grateful uh, for your time, Mukta Mooni Mukta, with the West Africa Centre for Counter Extremism, joining us on this conversation. Isaac, we need to go. Um, any more figures to take a look at as we wrap up? Well, I'm just looking at uh, our budget in terms of defence for 20, no, next year, 2024. Uh, we actually anticipate that uh, our defense budget will rise by some 13%, so from the 3.74 billion uh, CDs to 4.23 billion CDs. And if you look at the breakdown, the amount that we are spending uh, on headquarters and agencies is taking more than 90% of this amount, so there's little, uh, little actually for, for such operations, uh, so I keep, I still keep asking myself: Do we have any monies elsewhere, or do we have any resource elsewhere? Is there anyone going to fund this project or this intervention that we are going to have? Because I, I, I look at the cost, and then it comes at a time where almost all West African countries are actually. Yeah, and take a look at that: yeah. three point mm -hmm. seven four billion. That's for that's for this year: mm -hmm. three point seven four billion CDs, and if you do the breakdown. Uh, headquarters and agencies will take around uh, 3.5 billion cities. So if you pay salaries yes. and you do other few things, the money is gone. You don't have any other money, you know, to, for defense advisory services, for the purchase of ammunitions and all of those things. And Colonel, first of all, I just said something that 
you need to gauge the morale in you know of the military personnel and, and, and sense if they are actually ready are, are they really ready for for this action we know does this look like a peacekeeping mission because uh, I, I, it seems there's a difference between what we what actually happened in other countries versus what is actually happening now because i have this data to blizzard so if you look at what happened in mali in 2021 this is what ECOWAS did they placed economic sanctions yes. So there was a ban on trade on goods except food and fuel medicines to um, how do you call it Mali. Yeah. They also cut off from a regional um, you know financial markets. There was also they were also suspended from ECOWAS. ECOWAS yes. You know constitutional rule. Mm -hmm. And also so, we so know that the family members, the relatives, uh, exactly. I mean, they, they, they've isolated Niger. Niger and and, 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 and this 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 is not the first time there's there's been a coup uh, in West Africa. So right from 2020, we've had a series of coups. But I feel that ECOWAS wants to use the, this to, to stamp the authority and say enough is enough. You know, if you want to change government, you should do it the yeah. right way. It shouldn't be right. through military coup. And, and so I feel that's the reason why they still want to, 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 to use this um, as a means to tell anyone who want to do it later on that, look, this is not an option. The only option uh, is to go through... Um, you know, a democratic I see. Uh, lots and lots of uh, international developments that we are monitoring here on the polls. Uh, still ahead, when we get back from the break, Russia, India and China are reaching out to Africa. They control over 40% of the world's population. But this week, they are set to reach out to the continent through uh, their initiative called the BRICS. We'll talk about it when we get back. Please stay. Everybody came out, everybody's looking good, displaying their art, beautiful art everywhere. Um, this is my fifth year coming in a row. So I'm here every August for the festival. It's been amazing being with my black people all day, every day. It's been great. It's been fun here. There are a lot of art things to do. So I personally love it. And I love the artworks. I love Chalorote 2022. It's fantastic. This year's experience is, uh, is marvelous. It's amazing. It's Chalorot Festival. You ought to be here. The painting, the people, the Ghanaians were awesome. Everyone, when you're in Ghana, around the same time, make sure you check it out. It's really happening. Smile, hmm? Look lively, okay? Smile, smile! <laughs> Is the money too small? A bad stomach ruins your day. Don't let it. Take Gastron, your most effective antacid, for the relief of symptoms of peptic ulcer, heartburn, gas pain, flatulence, and indigestion. Hey guys, what are you waiting for? Let's go, let's go. Mwah. Can you bring down that smiles more? <laughs> Gastro, effective relief from stomach discomfort. Manufactured and distributed by NS Chemist Limited. This advertisement has been written and approved by the FDA. Daddy, daddy, <sighs> this tank is big. Yes, that's true. It can store a lot of water. That's so true. Wow. It has a working surface like this. Mm hmm That's so true. I can see S I N mm -hmm. T E mm -hmm. X syntax. That is so true, my daughter. When it falls down, it will spoil. That's not true. But why? Yay! Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> Syntex was the first to introduce double layer tanks in Ghana. Syntex again was the first to introduce white inner layers in Ghana. Syntex gives you the biggest warranty seven years. No matter your water needs, Syntex is the answer. Syntex tank. Are you strong? Are you tough? When everybody came out, everybody's looking good, displaying their art, beautiful art everywhere. Um, this is my fifth year coming in a row. So I'm here every August for the festival. It's been amazing being with my black people all day, every day. It's been great. It's so fun here. There are a lot of art things to do. So I personally love it. And I love the artworks. I love Chalote 2022. It's fantastic. This year's experience is, uh, is marvelous. It's amazing. It's Chalote Festival, y'all. You ought to be here. The paintings, the people, the Ghanaians were awesome. Everyone, when you're in Ghana, around the same time, make sure you check it out. It's really happening. She feels my head and it is hot. Are you all right? No. How can I when I'm not anyone's hero? My first failure occurred because I didn't listen to him. I wanted to go into the sciences. Okay. So, well, with my friends, we decided we were going to take the exam. <laughs> You believed so much in yourself. I said I was going to do it and I was going to make it big. I fell flat on my face. <laughs> I haven't put in that much salt okay. and pepper. In a world where determination meets innovation, a new wave of students is rising to conquer challenges and shape their destinies. But I'm telling everybody that agriculture is a next gold mine and me for instance the big men in ghana are all doing agriculture but you are not seeing it these extraordinary individuals are breaking barriers and blazing trails by embracing agriculture as a means to fund their education accommodation and meals they are not just students they are pioneers cultivating their dreams while cultivating the land i want to do farming as my profession that is what i want to do even though i'm schooling but the idea is not to go and sit in the office and put on tie or work in the government sector for monthly salary. At the University of Cape Coast, academic excellence meets hands-on experience. They don't even have to market it because there's ready market. Those who came in, we give them smaller plots. Now they've asked for a, a, a lot of plots and then they are expanding. Some are making as much as 4,000 Ghana cities a month.
And thanks for staying with us. The Electoral Commission says Parliament is undermining its efforts at having a credible voters register to organise the elections uh, for the nation. For more than a year now, the EC has failed to convince MPs to approve a new constitutional instrument uh, which outlaws the use of the guarantee system to register as a voter. In its place, the Commission uh, proposed the use of the Ghana card as a sole identity document to register as a voter. In a rare uh, bipartisan move, both the NPP and the National Democratic Congress MPs rejected the proposed recommendations to the EC, maintaining that the guarantee system is a position that the EC uh, has disagreed with and refused to uh, comply with, maintaining that uh, it has a draft CI. Well, uh, let's get more from my colleague, uh, Kweku Asante, was at the press briefing uh, that uh, the EC organized today. Uh, Kweku, thanks for joining us. Uh, tell us more about what the chairperson of the EC has been saying. Uh, and just before we're listening to that address that uh, she made today, what, what more can you say? Well, bless it. The Electoral Commission chairperson, Madame Dimensa, started her address with an onslaught on the guarantor system as we know it. She says it is fraught with challenges. It is allowing foreigners to decide for us who should lead us. And that is, in fact, the basis upon which the Electoral Commission is seeking to amend the CA that is currently before the House to make way for the new system which will outlaw the guarantor system. Let's listen to Madame Dimensa as she attacks. The principle, the, 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 the way the guarantor system works, and why the Electoral Commission cannot simply work with it. As a commission that is determined to conduct credible, transparent, fair, and peaceful elections, we were keen to establish and uphold the integrity of the foundational document, which is the voters' register. Hence, our proposal to use a Ghana card as a sole document for identification of a person's citizenship, as well as age. Our experience from the 2020 registration exercise, ladies and gentlemen, showed that several minors and foreigners using the window of the guarantor system found their way onto our rule. To read the register of minors and foreigners in 2020, the Electoral Commission established the District Registration Review Committees, which worked for several weeks to delete the names of minors and foreigners from the register. It took substantial time and effort to expound the names of illegal persons from our rule. During the registration, some 40,000 minors and foreigners were challenged, and we managed to expound some 15,000 minors and foreigners from the register. This number is one too many, considering that in times past, in a time past, we elected a president with less than 40,000 votes between the first and second runners up. In our view, this should not be countenanced or tolerated by any quarters, as it has the potential of undermining the credibility of our elections. The question we ask ourselves is why should we continue to use the guarantor system which opens the door to corrupt and illegal practices and undermines the credibility of our register some 30 years after it was first introduced and especially now when nearly 18 million Ghanaians above the age of 18, 15 years have the Ghana card. So, Kweku, there you have it, the position of the Electoral Commission on this matter. Uh, Madam Jim Menzel's response to the question uh, you posed about whether or not the EC will listen to the recommendation of Parliament uh, to include the guarantor system. Uh, what's, you know, the response from the chairperson of the EC? Hey, blessed. So, on the 31st of March, Parliament agreed, consensus, rare move on both sides to recommend to the Electoral Commission to amend its proposed CR to include the guarantor system. Madam Dimensa says that is not something that is up for discussion and will not be considered at all. Let's listen to it. Draft CI that is before Parliament, we are not, we do not intend to put back the guarantor system because we do not believe that the guarantor system has augured well for us. 30 years ago, when we took this journey and we did not have, you know, a Ghana card. It was only proper that we adopt a system that would ensure that 
people who didn't have any documentation could come on board. 30 years on as an evolving democracy, we now have the Ghana card, and we are saying that we must rely on it by the very laws that Parliament made. That is the LI 2111. And it's the surest way of ensuring or guaranteeing the integrity of our register. We noted that in 2020, pe the persons who qualified to vote around the country challenged some 40,000 minors and foreigners. And it took a lot of effort, time, and money to expound some 15,000 minors and foreigners from the role. And this is one too many. Can you imagine these minors and foreigners shaping the destiny of this country? You know, and we've, we know that in the past we've had very tight margins. And so we must be committed as a country to work towards ensuring the integrity of our role and to ensure that only those who qualify, you know, are on the role. Where in this world can we go to the United States and say we want to go and vote for their president? And so why are we allowing that here? And it's a well-known fact that the guarantor system is a door and a window to allow such corrupt and illegal practices. It is well known. There's documentation available that in 2020, foreigners were brought on board from across borders. I myself saw a video of a vehicle with French nationals who couldn't speak any language. You know, and so we are saying that we have evolved. Our mandate and our desire is to ensure that the register is credible. And by so doing, the intention is not to disenfranchise anybody. Having a credible register of persons who qualify, only eligible Ghanaians, is not to disenfranchise anybody. What and who we are preventing are foreigners and minors, and they do not qualify. And so we intend to maintain the draft CI. Quickly, here's the point, and, and it's a fact as well, that, that the Ghana card has not been issued to all eligible Ghanaians. We agree. So, so how does the EC intend to deal with it? You know, the Electoral Commission says it is going away for uh, the National Identification Authority to mop up and register as many Ghanaians as possible. We know that the CI is not before Parliament. Mm -hmm. But because of this, the Electoral Commission cannot wait, and they have to go ahead and do district-level elections. We also have to go ahead and register voters who have turned 18. In fact, since 2020, the Electoral Commission has not registered new voters. It's one of the reasons why the NDC and the hard right issue were raising a lot of concerns against the Electoral Commission. But that is some of the issues that they have to deal with currently. And according to the Electoral Commission, they will now have to rely on the NIV to mop up to register as many Ghanaians as possible so that they can go ahead and, and, and register those persons. But like she said, clearly, the Electoral Commission has no thought at all mm. on backing down on that demand okay. to make the Ghana card the sole identity document. And we must point out that regardless, uh, the limited registration exercise will continue. That's because the um, district assembly elections will have to proceed. So how will the EC deal with that, knowing that there's an upcoming district level elections? Well, so the Electoral Commission is disappointed that Parliament is not supporting it. In fact, the Electoral Commission Chair is Madame Dimensa makes the point that she believes the Electoral Commission is not being supported by Parliament to do its work. The Parliament may be undermining it in terms of how it continues to be able to deliver credible elections. Let's listen to Madame Dimensa there making that point that Parliament is not supporting it in terms of their ability to organize transparent free and fair elections. How can we continue to rely on the guarantor system to identify a citizen? Sorry, how can we continue to, to rely on the guarantor system to identify who a citizen is when Parliament has by itself passed a legislative instrument which states that for the purpose of identification of a citizen of Ghana, the Ghana card will be the sole document to be relied upon? And here, permit me to quote Regulation 71 of LI 2111, which states that a, na a national identity card issued to an individual shall be used for a number of transactions where identification is required. One of the mandatory transactions stated in Regulation 71 
is the registration of voters. It is therefore unfortunate that after making and passing a law that established the Ghana card as a sole means of identification of a citizen, we are by ourselves and undermining the very law that we have made. As a commission, we find it unfortunate that our efforts to strengthen the credibility and integrity of our voters' register, and by extension, our elections, by the introduction of the draft CI, did not receive the support of Parliament. Members of Parliament were of the view that the NIA should fully operationalize its mandate before the CI could be considered. Sadly, as we all know, the NIA has not fully commenced its operations nationwide due to a lack of resources. That leaves us with no option than to rely on the current CI with its inherent challenges to conduct a voter's registration exercise until such time as the NIA would become fully operational. So it's confirmed. Uh, they were set to announce a new date for, for the limited registration exercise and by extension, um, even the district level elections. Has that been cleared off the way now? Do we know when the elections will, will, will come off? Yes, blessed. As we speak, the Electoral Commission has firmed up the 12th of September to the 2nd of October to do the limited registration exercise. The minority had raised concerns together with the NDC that they wanted this registration exercise to take place at the electoral level, that is your polling station, the Electoral Commission said it's not doing that. It's going to hold this registration exercise at the district level. So all six, seven offices of the Electoral Commission, including the newly created Guan District, can, you can go there and do your registration. There have been questions to the Electoral Commission chairperson that there are so many communities that are very far off from the district level. He says that if persons are willing to vote, they must be willing to put in some effort to be able to register. The district level election would have suffered a few postponements. Postponement is now firming up, and it, on the 19th of December this year, the Electoral Commission will organize that election as well. Um, the, 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 the main challenge with that uh, district level election has been the issue about participation, uh, the fact that there's a significantly a low voter turnout. Uh, how different does the EC want to act now to, to endear more persons to that um, patriotic or national exercise? The mental starts off by saying that she wants to share that responsibility with the media. She believes that if the media dedicated some part of their time every day to draw attention to the district level election, it will be a factor. And so she in particular wants to meet every media house, dedicate 10 minutes every day to talk about the district level election. But the question also is that if so many people cannot register, the participation will be low. Historically, like you said, the, uh, the, the voter record for district level election have been completely low. The Electoral Commission says it is going to partner with all agencies, entity among others, to drive up the numbers at the various polling stations. That is something that they cannot do without the support of the general public. They want, to, they want a buy-in of everybody to come on board so that on the 19th of December, when the, the Ghanaian goes to the poll to elect their district level representative, that kind of participation will be that high. Mm -hmm. But the Electoral Commission knows that over the years, the, attempt, uh, the, the, the voting record has simply been low and they will try to do their best to raise the numbers this time around. Okay, yes. almost forgot about that, but you're in Parliament. Have you interacted with any of the MPs? Any reaction to this uh, press conference by the EC so far? Well, so MPs are still divided or not really on political party line. We know that at the time the EC laid a CIA, the minority opposed, the majority were for it. But on the 31st of March, some deal-making happened in Parliament. There were some taxes to be passed, and... There was some sort of arrangement that, okay, support us do this, we'll support you in your opposition to the ACCI. So in a rare bipartisan move, the majority joined their colleagues on the minority side to issue a report, which was signed by the Speaker of Parliament in South Urban Bargain to the Electoral Commission, recommending that the guarantor system is put back in the CI. What the EC says today, they are not going to listen to that. The MP say that if the EC does not listen to us, then the EC will not get to lay their CI. Mind you, the Electoral Commission does not have audience on the floor, so Madame Jim Mensa cannot come on the floor and lay the CI. She would normally have to do that through the majority leader. And if the majority leader has an agreement with the minority, he, he's bound by it. If he doesn't go by it, it will mean that in future, 
it will suffer if it is to get the minority to cooperate on any on any issue. But I, I must maintain that if the majority breaks rank for the minority and decide that they are going to support the EC, the, the CI can be laid because to be able to annul the EC CI as I slave, you need to third majority to do that, and the NDC does not have that. Mm, I see. Uh, we got something grateful. The Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture says it is uh, scaling up uh, some efforts to intervene and to augment fish production across the country to meet the protein needs of the country. Richard Kojunyako has more in this report. And so it's a way to make sure that we bridge the gap for uh, demand and supply. That is the aquaculture sector to use to bridge the gap. And so we are bringing up these students who have had first-hand experience at the university. And so they are here to do the practicals, more intensive one for three months. Then they can go out there and establish themselves. We are looking at uh, maybe giving them some startup initiative capital so that they can be on their own. Speaking at the graduation ceremony at the Amrahia Aquaculture Centre, Mavis Howard Kumsin expressed the determination of government to harness the potential of aquaculture in the country. She says the goal is to diversify the sources of animal protein and decrease the country's reliance on imported fish, contributing to national self-sufficiency and reducing pressure on natural fish stocks. Apart from this um, here one, we are also putting up the Anomabo Fisheries College, which will soon be completed. The Amahia one is basically for aquaculture, but with the Anumabu one, we also do, we, they learn um, fishing gear and that, a whole lot of uh, mean process in the fisheries. So that one, we will deal with the, how do you call it, the fishers themselves. This one is only for the graduates, that's the category we are taking here, but with the uh, Anumabu one, uh, whether you are a graduate or not, so long as you have some experience in fishing, you will come there and then build on whatever you have. So we are trying to expand the aquaculture sector because we believe that that is the key to sustainable fisheries in our country and the whole world is now moving towards uh, aquaculture sector. Yeah. She hinted that the Anomabu Fisheries College would be completed by the end of the year to augment the fishing needs of the country. I would say we are about 95% uh, completed. Um, we have done the boreholes. We are now waiting on the national grid for water and then the electricity. And we are also building fence for the school. And also, the, what is even hindering the, the, the starting is um, the accommodation for the principal and then the lecturers. As we speak, they have started with the accommodation. I believe by close of year, the accommodation will be completed. And next year, possibly we will we'll commission. The Ministry of Fish, Fish and Aquaculture Development has indicated that its approach to elevating aquaculture development involves implementing policies that promote responsible and environmentally friendly aquaculture practices. The graduates were commissioned by the minister to help propagate the development of aquaculture in the country. Richard Kudenya Akon, Joy News, Accra. And we return to Richard in court, who's monitoring the proceedings of Cecilia Abanadapa, who today argued through her lawyers that the decision uh, by the OSP to freeze her accounts is based on fuel by suspicion. There's more uh, from Richard, who's monitoring the developments in court. The court was a virtual one as lawyers for the OSP and that of the former minister, Cecilia Abnadapa, joined the meeting virtually to make the argument on the application filed by the OSP seeking to confirm the freezing of the account of Madame Cecilia Dapa and also the seizure of the properties found in her matrimonial home. The OSP contends that the move is to facilitate its investigations on corruption and corruption-related offences. According to the OSP, Madam Cecilia Dapa has several homes, and the fact also reveals the ownership of the amount of money found in her home, and in her account remain in dispute, and the sources and origins of the money also remain...
$2.7 and 2.7 million Ghana cities. This was after the OSP says it initiated investigations into suspected corruption against Madame Cecilia Dapa following information arising from the criminal case. The OSP prayed the court to grant the application to confirm the seizure and the freezing of the properties of the former minister. The OSP, however, did not mention the amount of money standing to the credit of the former minister in the banks. Lawyer for the former minister, Victoria Bad, opposed the application. She submitted that the application before the court has been brought in contravention of the very statutory provisions that the OSP purports to rely on in invoking the jurisdiction of the court. She indicated that the fact that the sums of money were found in Madame Dapa's matrimonial home is not enough ground to suspect or imply that those sums of money are tainted property. Likewise, she says there is no basis to suspect that the monies in Madame Dapa's account are tainted property, especially when banks are routinely required on a daily basis to report suspicious transactions. And thus, the assertion that the OSP needs to freeze the account to facilitate investigations is unjustified, since every information he requires in the alleged suspicion of tainted property will be contained in the bank statement. For her, the application has been brought in flagrant breach of the OSP's own enabling legislation and seeks to perpetrate an arbitrary exercise of powers based on nothing more than suspicion fueled by misrepresentation of fact and resultant media frenzy and that the court should resist the temptation to be enmeshed in illegality. It was also revealed in court by the OSP that both the former minister and the husband were placed under arrest and granted bail. In fact, the court has adjourned its ruling to the 31st of August for determination of this case. Reporting from the court complex, my name is Richard Kujenya Akun for Joy News. And just before we go, we tell you about our te test day discovery for today. Uh, we head you over to the Ashanti regional capital, uh, Kumasi, where Kwesi Debra has the latest for us. more pressure on it before it can operate. But looking at our grandparents, they don't have the strength to do that. So we decided to build this triple power spraying machine to solve that problem. Because this one, there is no need for you to add pressure on it. It uses three different power sources, which is the dry cells, the rechargeable batteries, and the solar panel too. You can connect with the solar panel here, it will work. If you don't want to use the solar panel to use the rechargeable batteries, that one too, it will work, and as well as the dry cell. If you want to start it, there is a key here. Then you switch it on. Then you press the trigger. No, the, there is water inside, but I can still lift it. It's not heavy. It's made up of hard plastic. And the belt are also tough. It's not like the one in the market with the tiny belt, whereby if you back it, it will be causing pains to your shoulders. The belts are very tough. You can back it for a long period of time, and you will not become tired. And you can stay for a longer time. All right. This one is having the same capacity as the already existing one in the market. But the difference is this one is lighter as compared compared to the one in the market. In the sense that this one is made up of plastic. And the weight is 1.5 kilos, kilos, and the other one, the already existing one in the market, is 4 kilograms. Yeah, yeah, no this one is using lithium-ion battery. That makes it very less in weight. And the one in the market is using lead-acid battery, which makes it very heavier. So, and if you can, uh, the belt too is very tough. It's not the one, the one in the market, the belt are light. So if you back it, it will be causing pain to your shoulders. But this one, the belt are very tough. If you back it, it doesn't experience any pain in your shoulders. Reporting for Joy News, Chrissy Deborah. Residents of Ofanko are raising concerns about the nature of the road network within the community. That's more for you. 
Please repair the road for me because I'm already dying. Anytime I return from the hospital, my health deteriorates because of this road. That was 85-year-old grandmother, Amelia Hayford, speaking to me after she had returned from the hospital. For her, visiting the hospital can only be possible if she gets a neighbor to carry her to a nearby car, else she cannot go. Her daughter, Tama Hayford, says this has become necessary due to the destruction of their road. Carrying her to the car will take about 30 minutes. And to the car, she has to relax before the driver even sets off. By the time she gets to the hospital, her BP is way, way, way high. So she has to be detained. I mean, going to the hospital and back, it's a very, very big problem for her and for us. This morning, this morning, she was crying. How can, how can it be? It's, it's, it's not good at all. She says this depression situation causes her mother to sometimes wish she's no more. Jeez, we went to the hospital um, when Tuesday. She told the doctor that she wishes she, and she had to give her depression medicine, which is so bad. And my mom, she's depressed. She's very, very, very depressed. So please, whoever we have to talk to, to do whatever. I, I mean, I'll break down. I think the little we've said, the government, not the road minister, should listen to our plea. This is not the first time we've done this. This road you see behind me was once a bustling street connecting this area that's veterinary and the orphan court barrier. But today, it's been left to a pale shadow of its former self. Something you can best describe as an uncompleted open drain. The residents are saying one thing. The government needs to act and must act quick. I think we are, get, we are getting worried. There are aged in the community. Aged men and women. How do they go to the hospitals? How do they attend to their medical situations? The school peoples that trek these areas, their lives are always in danger. You are out there working. You are afraid of the fate of your wife, your husband, your kids. It's very pathetic. The residents say they are tired of the flooding situation that occurs anytime it rains as a result of the uncompleted drainage which has led to the destruction of their rule and the and it's now official joy prime joy fm and all the multimedia group limited platforms are media partners for the biggest carnival here in ghana we're talking about the chaliwati street art festival it's an annual colorful festival of sights and scenes with thousands of revelers to be treated to a rich african heritage at down street painting um you know graffiti and others you name it and trust me, uh, with the multimedia group involved in this, this is going to be an explosion. So it's going to be a promotion of our creative arts economy while achieving the mission to sell and promote Ghana. And uh, just as the name indicates, it's uh, Chalewati Festival. Uh, the festival is flip-flopping to a new location this year or so. So come along, let's uh, make the event unforgettable. And we are getting so many unforgettable uh, memories at Osu from the 21st of August to the 27th uh, of August 2023. You need to be a part of that. And uh, that's all we have for you in this package of the polls. I am blessed as wrapping up the show. Log on to myjoyonline.com.